Okay, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, the next presentation, and I hand, yes. over, hand you over then to, to Joe Levy of CNED in Switzerland. And he's going to talk about the the weapon detection tool that he's using and creating in, in Impetus. So, so please, Joe. Let me uh, first allow us, uh, thank you for allowing us to participate in uh, this presentation. It is an honor. My name is Joe, actually Joachim Levy, and I am one of the co-founders at uh, Synedit. Synedit is part of the Impetus Consortium, and we have one tool, which is the uh, weapon detection tool uh, as an intelligent video analytics tool. The weapon detection tool has a very clear mission, uh, which is to detect weapons to prevent loss of life. Um, and for this, we have different approach, of course, uh, using already installed CCTV cameras, but also trying to being able to overcome the challenge of data privacy uh, that are confronted with us uh, in regards to GDPR compliance. So our tool, as you can see on this image, uh, detects weapons, but when it detects a weapon, what it does is like it provides instant situational awareness. By that, it means that it shares in real time with the dispatcher a snapshot JPEG of the weapon, that is what the camera saw with the bounding box, as well as the GPS coordinates. Now, as you can see that even by using on our end, the latest machine learning on AI algorithms, detecting a weapon using CCTV cameras, it's hard because the camera angle and the environment is never the same. You can take a camera that you have today in Oslo, you can take the same camera in Padova, the angle is going to be a little bit different, the environment is going to be different, such as lighting. Um, some countries can be very cloudy, snowy, rainy, like in Oslo, and sunny, like in Padova. So how do you technologically, the approach you have to have, like us, we work exclusively in infrared, meaning only with the night mode vision on, as you can see on the images below except the image on the right, which was in the city of New York of a real shooting. So we all know that when weapons are not detected, it will lead to expensive site closure and loss of life because the AI they use cannot be automatically calibrated when the camera angle changes. It is obvious that the person that you see on the bottom left, this policeman, who responded at the Charlie Hebdo attack a few years ago, lacked terrible situational awareness. He had no clue as a first responder that his opponents were heavily armed and therefore he was outgunned. And that is what we call loss of life. So as a result, existing weapon detection system, they sadly produce false alerts. Because they do not have a top to bottom approach like Synedit has. So we have something unique, is that we learned that to detect a weapon, first of all, the artificial intelligence needs to be very accurate. But how do you keep accuracy? You need data in order to build better AIs. And working with smart cities requires data sharing. And this is a major hurdle for our consortium, I mean, for a company like ours, because it is a problem that due to GDPR compliance, it is very limited how the amount of data that we can receive between smart cities and high-tech companies like Synedit. And the problem number two that we have is called AI drifting. 
It means that an artificial intelligence becomes unstable. You see an AI is trained in a lab in a close environment, but as soon as you take out that AI and deploy it in another environment, the, product, the predictions will not be the same. You not, you're not gonna have like a confidence of maybe 96, 95%. It will drop down to 80%. And then you're gonna have a lot of false alerts. For the brains in this session, here we show you a linear regression of what it means AI drifting. So of course, we're trying here to predict the target variable Y. And why I'm showing this, this. I'm showing you this because I need to show you like what this is the seriousness of AI drifting. It, it, it is a very common issue, but it needs to be addressed in order to make the smart cities safer. So AI drifting, means that in order to prevent it, the artificial intelligence needs to be retrained. It needs to receive more data in order to remain accurate. So when we update an artificial intelligence, when we receive more data to have a better weapon detector, it's the same way that when you use your phone and you do an update on one of the apps that you have. Now imagine if you'd be using the same app for the last three years without an update, most probably you would not be using it because it would be simply outdated. And so by sharing data from partner cities, this can prevent drifting and it keeps the weapon detection tool very, very accurate. And to do this, we need smart cities to provide sample data as an input to the artificial intelligence retraining process. But as you know, we have very strong GDPR regulations that are related to the sharing of data. You see on the screen here on the left, the person is actually entirely obfuscated in black. It means that we are not at all revealing any biometric data. We never record constantly. Our system only records when there's an alert. Yet it is very challenging to ask smart cities, can you send a person on the streets with a gun? We'd like to train our model. And this is one of the major challenges that we are and we have been facing together, Synedit and the partner cities of the consortium of images. However, once you bypass this, you can make the city safer. And actually we had a breakthrough a few days ago when we did our acceptance pilot with the city of Padova, because we had this restraint of not being able to have the required data. So we decided to build synthetic data using 3D fake slash real people. And by doing so, we are now very happy that we can still remain fully GDPR compliant. There's no bias in AI building a model that involves people holding guns. Now we can produce, if you want to be clearly GDPR compliant, your data sets that you receive from the smart cities need to be 50% men, 50% women. And in those male and female, you have to have an exact ratio of 50%. 50% white Caucasian and 50% color. And then you have to have dark skin color, light skin color, which was not possible before. But with the input of synthetic data from 3D images, and I'm talking about the same 3D images we use in high-end feature film, it is now possible. So there is no longer a bias idea towards the artificial intelligences that we're using in order to detect weapons. So with GDPR compliant, sharing of sample data, our AI can now help you remain safe and prevent terror attacks. I still need to point out that without a trained AI, unfortunately, 
the type of event that happened at the Bataclan, Bataclan in Paris is more likely it could happen to any one of us. So I would like to call on everything, everyone to say, so what are you gonna do about it? Meaning, are you ready to share data by keeping your GDPR compliance? Yes, of course, but do not hold back and do not close doors to artificial intelligences because we are here to make you safer. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay, Joe, I have a question for you. When you said weapons, I think it's been implicit in what you say that you mean essentially pistols and rifles. If we were to try to extend this to be another kind of weapon, for example, knives, how dramatic a retraining would that be? Would that be starting from scratch? Or would that be something that the same underlying technology could be trained to adapt to? Indeed, could you have one system that could detect both guns and knives in the same system? In order to detect weapons, first of all, thank you for this question, Joe. Um, to detect weapons, we today have multiple artificial intelligence. We're talking about small magazine-fed weapons. So a small handgun, a small revolver. And if you can detect a small handgun, then you can obviously also detect AR-15 or an M-16. That's part of our data set. That is what we can do today. Now, when we talk about weapons such as a knife, a knife is by nature much thinner object. And a knife will create what we call a lot of false alerts, false positives. So it calls for what we call pose estimation, the extrusion of the skeleton that you see on people would be like analyzing the movement and the behavior of passers-by. And this type of artificial intelligence is actually entirely different than just recognizing objects such as small magazine-fed uh, guns. Okay. So a knife, you would have to analyze this movement of someone reaching with a hand. Therefore, it is possible, and thank God we're using edge devices manufactured by NVIDIA, because we have the ability to throw on those edge devices that act as AI, that act as little brains, to turn CCTV cameras, to provide, to enable AI to CCTV cameras. We can now... In the future, it is possible to add knife detection, but is it, it is an entirely type of cooking, I would say. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you, Joe. Uh, I see that Mathieu also has his hand up to ask a question. Yeah, uh, I was curious about uh, your thanks for, for the presentation, first of all. Uh, I was curious about another aspect of training and maybe relative to a, a less dramatic uh, change. Um, say, a city um, has a, a set of cameras and they are using the, the solution. And at some point they decide that it's time to, uh, to change the hardware and to have new cameras uh, with potentially slightly different. Uh, I, I assume that you know, some of the, the, the recognition will still happen, but how much of an impact uh, would that be? How much of a retraining would that require? And, and, and how much time would that require to, to basically be at the same level of performance as before? Or would there be any impact in, in, in a sense? Thank you, Mathieu, for this question. So today, when we train a model for the city of Oslo, we're taking a few thousand images only, but the camera is a fixed camera. Now, if that camera would move or they would put that into another camera. What we do with the team of, uh, led by our CTO, Mikael, he would need new data. And first, he would simply take a sample clip from this new camera and say, okay, let's just process that footage and let us just see how accurate the gun detector is. Now, if the gun detector is not accurate, it will need retraining. 
but it's going to be much faster than what we had, I would say, at the early stage of impetus, because we have learned to build AI models with only a few thousand images. Therefore, retraining will happen here at our lab on site in about a day and a half. And so the constraint is just to have on-premises retraining and sharing at least a little bit of data so that we can also rebuild it in 3D. There's still, it's not yet automated, but we do hope that in the future, we're gonna be able to automate this process. And again, a message from our CTO, there will never be a meta model that could detect any type of weapon using any type of camera angle. This is utopic. That is the reason why our system requires strict technical guideline. You can take any camera you want, but you have to respect the camera angle, the shutter speed, and as well, make sure that you're using night mode uh, vision on it. If not, no, it's going to be messy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mathieu. Martina, had you had your hand up too? Yeah, just a quick uh, question, because in previous presentation, we talked about uh, the acceptance uh, pilot. And as you also mentioned in your presentation, you had uh, the possibility or you were, <laughs> in any case, uh, obliged to do different uh, tests in Oslo and then uh, in, uh, in Padova. So I would like to know if you can share with us uh, some preliminary feedback uh, from the operators and also what was your yes. experience uh, in uh, dealing uh, with uh, this kind of different uh, tests? So in Oslo, the, um, when we did the acceptance pilot in November, uh, we prepared and then the test was supposed to be in daytime, but we did it in nighttime. And we felt very confident because we use the night vision mode. So regardless of daylight, indoor, outdoor, the image quality is still very high. And so we send the dispatcher outside with their replica gun. And right away, the gun was detected for the first time at the Sock of Oslo. And I do very vividly remember one of the security officers pulling out his cell phone at the SOC and calling his buddies at the Oslo airport saying from security, saying, hey, uh, I'm seeing this weapon detection system and it just, it works. That's outstanding. Now, that was great because we were on premises in Oslo. What we did in Padova had a different, completely different approach, different cameras. So we tried the model that we had and they have multiple cameras. So we had the limitation of building what we call a small meta modem. Therefore, uh, Liron, our junior data scientist said, you know what, we cannot just wait like this and hope for more videos of people holding guns because that ain't going to happen. So within a day and a half, we build a 3D character and we recreate the scene of what the camera would see in Padova. In 3D, it was all photo real and fake and synthetic, put it this way. And we threw in a 3D character with a lot of guns and we were able to complete the missing data with synthetic data. And of course, we were 3,000 kilometers away uh, for the acceptance pilot of Padova. So we processed first a real stream from the hallway in the office that we shared the alert in real time at the SOC of Padova. Then we processed the real footage that was recorded in Padova, which was a person holding a real gun with real bullets. That person was a policeman, police woman. But strangely, Impetus is calling for innovation. And doing demos, what we do, sometimes we use a messenger app so that we can share the alerts 
on the first responder's smart device. This is key. This is key. You don't want your first responder to be outgunned when he goes on site. So what did we do? We used Telegram Messenger with a bot for the acceptance pilot. And at our surprise, the people from the SOC of Padova were very happy to say, what is this tool? I, hold on, I am getting an alert and I can share in real time the GPS coordinate, a JPEG and a video shot of the alert with my first responders. Wow, that's amazing. So we were baffled because somewhere you have to be very much GDPR compliant, but on the other hand, you wanna help save people. So those acceptance pilots were entirely different, but allowed us to rethink and see how we can reintegrate real-time alerting using uh, innovative tools so that first responders have what we call, again, situational awareness so that they can feel safer when they respond. I hope Martina was able to, to answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks indeed, Jonah. I think this thing of using the synthetic data opens a lot of possibilities for faster progress with, with many aspects of the work, I think. I think we have to close there because of the time, Joe. So thank you very much indeed. Thank and you for allowing us to present. Thank you. You're very welcome, Joe. So now, now we can move on with the second last session of the day. And this is from Karen Sanilera and Joachim Garcia Alfaro from Telecom Sud Paris. And they're going to talk about ontology based attack graph enrichment. So I don't know which of the two of you are going to start, but please just go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Karen Sanilera and uh, I uh, will present you a cybersecurity uh, solution proposed uh, by uh, me, Joaquin Garcia Alfaro, Frederick Stupens and Nora Kubens, um, as part of the Impetus project. So um, we propose an uh, uh, ontology-based attack graph enrichment approach. This approach is uh, based on logical attack graph. So uh, um, to the next session, I will first talk about the motivation um, behind the approach and the background about um, graph and logical data graph. Then uh, uh, I will talk about the approach and the implementation of the approach. And I will do a comparison between um, the related work and our approach. And then I will conclude. So uh, an attack graph uh, is a graphical representation of uh, the path that an attacker can take uh, to reach a goal. Um, generally, the attack graph are uh, used by uh, um, cybersecurity experts in order for them to make decisions about uh, the remediation they have to take uh, um, uh, to mitigate um, a attacks. Um, but uh, for the generation of attack graph, uh, we require uh, generally uh, two types of information. Um, there are information about the network and vulnerabilities information. The problem is that networks and vulnerabilities uh, information are constantly changing. So in order for the attack graph to be completely faithful with the change of the system, we need to uh, do a real-time monitoring of the network system. So we can confirm that an attack is successful. So uh, this allows to do a mapping um, with the alerts from the monitored system. So um, we can move uh, from a proactive uh, attack graph to a reactive attack graph. First of all, a graph is a set of vertices and a set of edge or arcs. A directed graph uh, consists of a non-empty set of vertices and uh, a set of uh, Arcs that are formed by pairs of elements of vertices. 
So to be able to understand what is a logical attack graph, we need uh, to know first what is an end or graph. An end or graph is a direct graph where each vertex um, is either an or or an end uh, vertex. So a vertex represents an objective. So according to the type of vertex, um, this uh, objective will need the, the conjunction or disjunction of uh, the children of the vertex to, uh, in order for the vertex to be fulfilled. So based on these three definitions, we can say that a logical attack graph uh, is uh, based on an um, and our logical directed graph. So the nodes of our logical facts that, uh, uh, that represent action that the attacker has to take in order to reach a goal or uh, the precondition that have been, uh, uh, that need to be respected in order that the, this action can be taken by the attacker. And the arc represents the relationship between the nodes of the graph. So in order to validate our approach, we, pro uh, we, we propose a use case a scenario based on a smart city. So this is scenario concerns a network. In this network, we have uh, um, two, um, three computers. And um, the first computers that each, that is uh, the Alex computer represent uh, the bridge print. Are, this is the computer where the attacker is located. And uh, there is another computer, the Olivia computer that is a vulnerable uh, machine. There, on this machine, there exists uh, the blue key vulnerability that is a, a vulnerability that allow remote attacker um, to execute a code on the machine in order to, con to remotely connect from a remote desktop protocol to the machine. So um, the, um, when the attacker connect to this machine, um, this uh, vulnerability will give him um, uh, the access to read the, the memory of this machine. So if the credentials uh, of the user uh, are saved on the memory of this machine, the attacker can then harvest the credential and reuse them. The problem is that the Fred machine and the Olivia machine have the same domain credentials. So the attacker can connect to Fred machine. That is a critical asset. It, this is a computer that contains a lot of uh, sensitive information about the bus transportation of the city. So the attacker can then modify this information. This will lead to a mass of people on the buses and this will cause panic and violence. So to, to validate the approach, as I said, we use a logical attack graph uh, approach. So we need uh, to, use, um, to use logic programming um, in order to validate the approach. So the first, uh, um, the first uh, uh, code explained that uh, um, if an attacker A execute a code on uh, the machine H, so the attacker will have access on this, uh, on this machine. So the execution of code on the machine is the precondition uh, for the access to the machine. And then in order for the attacker to harvest the credential on the machine of the user U, um, the attacker has to previously execute uh, um, the code on the machine and the credentials of the user have, uh, to, have to be sa saved on the memory of the machine each. So um, then uh, by doing all this step of logical, uh, logical um, programming, this, this will allow the attack graph generation. 
So in order to enrich the attack graph, uh, we will require um, the information from the monitored, uh, monitored system. So a mapping is necessary between the information on the attack graph and the information coming, coming from the monitored system. So uh, the information in the attack graph will let, let you know that uh, um, there exists a vulnerability X in this case that we can say that this is uh, the CVE um, 2002 um, on the machine edge. And uh, this uh, vulnerability allows the attacker to execute code on the machine, that is the action. And this will lead to the impact of privilege escalation on the machine. And also in the attack graph, we can know that on this machine edge, there is a user that is using this machine, the user U, and uh, a project S uh, that represents uh, the Apache, uh, Apache product is installed on the machine. So, um, and this, uh, um, pro uh, the protocol that this project is used uh, use is the TCP protocol represented by the P. And, uh, I represent um, the port that each the 80 port. So we have all this information on the logical attack graph uh, um, in terms of semantic information. And then we receive uh, the information from the monitored system uh, about uh, the port uh, and, uh, and the protocol that is uh, being uh, a user. So then the system um, will know that um, the attacker is trying to exploit this vulnerability. So, but uh, um, to finish with the enrichment process, uh, um, a vulnerability ontology is required. This will uh, allow uh, the system to know what are the other post conditions that can be um, uh, exploited based on the exploitation of the vulnerability. So if uh, a tweet exists on uh, a vulnerable um, component of the monitored system, and then the, the algorithm has filed uh, some uh, um, post conditions of the exploited vulnerability in the ontology. So new paths will uh, be added on the attack graph. And uh, uh, in the case of our scenario, that is uh, the, uh, the panic and violence, the goal is to cause panic and violence on the bus. Um, uh, the system, the algorithm know that uh, the reboot of the machine will, uh, will not allow people to have uh, a access to the information about uh, the bus transportation. So uh, they, this can also cause panic and violence. So uh, uh, in this fact, uh, an arc will be added between these two nodes, um, which will finish with the process of the enrichment of the attack graph for this time. So in order to, uh, to validate the, the approach for the implementation, we use a reasoning engine that is based on logical programming. This tool is uh, Mulval. Um, it is an open source tool for attack graph generation. Um, we also use uh, the vulnerability description ontology of needs and uh, an integration of a prelude and elk stack. And we create uh, a web interface for the attack graph visualization. So the logic programming allows users to go from the topological graph to the logical attack graph. A topological graph only contains um, the, the different connection between the different assets on, of the network, but it, it does it not it don't give information 
about the action that uh, the attack, the different action that the attacker will take in order to reach the goal. So um, there is a, this is the advantage uh, by using a logical attack graph because uh, a logical attack graph uh, um, show all the path that the attacker can take. The um, the actions in the logical attack graph are represented by the node um, in green. Um, so in this case, we see that there is a lot of action that the attacker have to take uh, a, in uh, practice uh, in order to exploit, um, to reach the goal. And uh, the vulnerability uh, represented by red um, node in this case. Also an advantage uh, with uh, the logical attack graph is that uh, a logical attack, attack graph uh, have uh, a lot of uh, inferences abilities because uh, it uh, it is a semantical um, approach. The logical attack graph contains all the semantical information about uh, the attack graph, so it is uh, really more uh, easy to do the mapping between uh, the the proactive graph and the information coming from the monitored system, in this case, the alerts, the logs, and the information from the vulnerability description ontologies. And then it is a very a more simple to, to, do a, to, to do the enrichment of the graph and to go to the logical reactive at a graph. So um, a lot of approaches about uh, uh, attack graph generation exist in the literature, but uh, there, they, there are uh, some limitations. For example, um, there, there exists an approach about uh, the attack graph generation based on logical uh, um, programming and uh, use of uh, a, a SIM in order to monitor the system and to do a correlation. But the problem with this approach is that for the uh, proactive attack, attack graph, they did not take into account the state of the network. They um, only use the information about the vulnerabilities. And there also exist approaches uh, that are based on planning programming. Um, uh, in this case, uh, they didn't, did, don't uh, uh, do an uh, enrichment of the attack graph based on the change of the network. So this will not really help uh, the cybersecurity expert because they will have uh, each time to generate the graph. And uh, there also exist uh, approaches that use uh, ontology for the attack graph generation, but more of the approaches uh, just use the ontology in order to enrich the ontology, a cybersecurity ontology with information for a form an attack graph. Um, so it's the same problem. Um, there is no real time monitoring on the system. And, uh, and then there also exists uh, other approach where they are uh, updating the graph based on ontology, but the cybersecurity experts have to enrich the ontology with the data of the network. So it is not a work that is being doing uh, automatically. So in terms of efficiency, it's not really e efficient for the cybersecurity expert. So um, to conclude, uh, um, in this approach, we take into account uh, the real-time um, update of the system and uh, the evidence uh, of uh, the semantic information of the logical attack graph uh, is really help uh, for uh, doing the inferences and uh, of, uh, enrich the attack graph in the real-time um, process. So uh, if you have any questions, I will take them for the moment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. Okay, Karen, I have a question. At the very beginning, you, you explained this is about networks. Then you talked about ontologies. Something you didn't really mention, though, is how big the networks could be, how, how many nodes there would be in a network. And when you apply these techniques, are there scalability issues as the number of, of, of items in the network increases? And, and, how, and have you tested it on what sizes of networks? 
Okay. Yes, in fact, um, the problem with the scalability of the network uh, uh, has been uh, um, uh, addressed in other research. So in this case, uh, in order to avoid uh, this problem, um, for the impetus project, uh, uh, as uh, we are uh, doing the, we have doing the integration with uh, uh, another partner, XM Cyber. So um, the idea is uh, like to just uh, um, take only the network is big, but there is a segmentation. So for the attack graph generation, we will just take the the component that uh, uh, um, will event for uh, one uh, scenario. So for each scenario, um, we have a big network, but not all the machine can attack all the machine in the network. So it is, uh, it is the, 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 the uh, 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 kind of uh, a solution to this is to do the segmentation. So by using like, you, we, we have just to, group them by the asset that can uh, that can be a critical asset based on uh, a one other machine for example the alex machine in the very beginning i will go back okay for example an attacker that is located on the alex machine for example can uh, can allow if it affect the fred machine it can all it can allow affect, uh, for example, twenty machine on the network. So in this case, for we we separate this uh, by scenario, and we will not have the problem of scalability um, by the edge of the network. I don't know if I answer your question. I, I think so. If I understood correctly, you 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 seg segment the network to the the key machines of interest in a particular scenario. It wouldn't be feasible to involve every computer in a big network, the scalability would then be a problem, if I understand. Yes, what, yes, what I maybe did not explain well is that the possibility to um, have access to all the machine exists, still exists, but we have to select which machine we, we want to, for which machine so, we want to see like the vulnerabilities. For example, okay. the blue key vulnerability from Olivia will cause impact on maybe 10 machines. So if we select the machine of Olivia, we will see the attack graph for this 10 machine in the network. And if we select the machine of Fred, for example, maybe it's only concerned 20 machines. Okay. Thank you, Karen. We have a, a more fundamental question from Tom Robertson in the chat. And he asks, please explain how attack graphs are used in impetus. Are they displayed to cyber experts? Are they used to initiate defense? Yes. So um, for, this, uh, for, for this moment, we are just, uh, we already uh, um, test uh, the attack graph uh, um, generation and enrichment on the acceptance pilot. So the, the, the goal in this paper, we only talk about the attack graph enrichment, but the final goal is not to just stay on the attack graph enrichment, but also to propose uh, optimal remediation based on the attack graph uh, um, generation and enrichment. So in one paper, we cannot uh, talk about all uh, the all the solution in one paper. So I think it's the problem. Uh, so I don't know if I answer. But the the the, the in fact it's uh, the the final final solution will, will be for defense. Like in order for the cybersecurity expert to know, okay, which um, remediation I have to apply in order to avoid uh, this attack or uh, to take uh, the, some measure to repair uh, the problem I have because uh, they already reached the attack on my network. Okay, I, I think you did answer Tom's question uh, uh, because fundamentally, indeed, is for defense that this is all about and you're looking at a particular dimension of, of reaching there, I, th I think. I think we need to move on with respect to the time. 
So I think we say thank you very much, Karen. And we move on now to the last session of today. And that will be presented by Paolo Moshilin from University of Padova. And the title is An Approach to a Safe, safe Egress from Public Spaces Driven by Risk Principles. So please, Paolo. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Mocellin, and I am a researcher at the Department of Industrial Engineering of the Italian University of Padova. Today, I want to share with you our research activity dealing with an approach to a safe egress from public spaces driving by risk principle. This work is carried out within and thanks to the Impetus Horizon 2020 project funded by the European Commission under a research and innovation program. Besides me, Matteo Bottin, Chiara Vianello, Giulio Rosati, and Giuseppe Mas are contributing to this research with different uh, uh, roles. This research moves from the Impetus Horizon 2020 project. Uh, it aims at integrating interdependent solutions and concerns approaching three pillars, technologies, processes, and ethics, to improve the security of public spaces, smart cities, assisting uh, law enforcement, and then users in responding to complex events. One of the tools that is being developed in the project is at suggesting and assisting end users in optimizing uh, the response to scenarios triggered by an event. This approach can work together with smart city sensors and actuators, for example, with people counting sensors, to help to respond to critical events, uh, facilitating coordination and the dispatch of required resources as efficiently as possible. Just a few words on the university to which we belong. Uh, the University of Padova is one of the oldest and most prestigious systems in Europe. It was founded in the 1222. This year is 800 year old. Uh, it is linked to many famous names, including Copernicus, Vesalius, Galileo, and William Harvey. Padua University has been a pioneer of several endeavors with the first university botanical garden in the world, now UNESCO World Heritage Site and the first permanent anatomic theater inaugurated in 1678, which is here represented. Currently, it has more than 60,000 students and more than 100 bachelor and master degree programs incarnated in 32 departments. The University of Padua within Impetus Project represents an academic partner for research activities that are carried out by two research groups with different expertise. The first is at Professor Giuseppe Maschio and the other by Professor Giulio Rosati. Our contribution to the project is expected to make available to the consortium scientific knowledge on crucial aspects, including the management of crowds, but also to model peculiar features of the two pilot cities involving the project Padova in and also in Norway in relation to physical configuration of open public spaces, emergency routes and distribution and uh, people flow. So why an approach to people aggress from open public spaces? This question is topical since we usually hear about crowds, management of public spaces, emergency plans for railway station, airports and so on. In fact, a critical triggering event may induce or require the aggress of people simultaneously. Think, for example, to a terroristic attack targeting a vulnerable public space or more frequently planned events that require the aggress of a large number of people. For each of these, the topic of egress management emerges. Crowd forces can reach levels that are almost impossible to resist or control when escalating. Unfortunately, deadly crowd surges have occurred for decades. This means that people can die or be injured during a critical egress. In other words, a poor crowd management can lead to side effects. Critical is the crowd control versus the crowd management in the sense that an approach to such situations should include a process that considers all human behavior in crowds. In this framework, the so-called crowd science can and should assist law enforcement and support end users when managing complex events that may originate from triggering events and that ask for a crowd management under different boundary conditions. We can say that the crowd science refers to the scientific approach to crowds. Uh, in fact, crowds behave according to some rules that can be approached systematically. 
through models that embed physical constraints, geometry, and human behavior during evacuations. The science therefore relies on the scientific approach to study the flow of crowds in different situations, including normal and anomalous scenarios. It may help in designing and optimizing public spaces oriented at handling large number of people simultaneously and safely. In addition, simulations and models can give valuable information for a planning step, including egress timings and critical people density associated to operating criteria. On this line, simulating people egress from an open public space can be used to recreate reference scenarios, which can be spent in different ways. Firstly, to support emergency operators in planning and managing evacuations. Then to predict the human behavior and parameters related to the egress according to different boundary conditions. Finally, related considerations can support the optimization of the response to a critical event, uh, enhancing, let's say, the resilience against the side effects related to crowds triggered by threats. Modeling an aggressive scenario involves different parameters that require a proper quantification. One of the most challenging is the human behavior in crowds. Typically, we are asked to answer the questions like, does the crowd experience panic or rationality? or people crowd do show altruism or egoism. The overall crowd behavior is uh, determined uh, according different factors, including cognitive aspects linked to expectations, knowledge of a specific context and attitudes, but also by environmental factors, including social rules and influence on people. Finally, behavior of the component of a crowd is sensitive to behavioral factors like social skills and the familiarity. In a general perspective, the results of a crowd movement can be quantified in terms of flow rate of people, that is the number of people circulating per unit of time with respect to a location. Space, direction, and time determine how a group of people moves inside a public space. The complexity is also enhanced by the possibility of different triggering events at the pace of the crowd behavior. Crowds may circulate according to the degree and detail information and knowledge collected by people, but also depending on operative strategies imposed during an aggress scenario. The latter, uh, different from the previous parameters, uh, is intended as an external constraint held by emergency actors that can induce specific responses by the crowd. Simulation tools based on validated parameters can assist in dealing with such a complexity on egress dynamics. We propose an approach based on the rationale that is shown in this slide. The aim is supporting decisions and response by law enforcement and the end users optimizing the management of large groups of people. Based on selecting geometry, pedestrian behavior, and configuration of escape routes, the egress is first simulated according to some reference scenarios that can be discussed with the stakeholders. Such scenarios are compared with data retrieved by sensors, for example, counter person sensors that allow defining the real context in terms of numerosity and people distribution. On this basis, the framework can be ranked in terms of risk in order to set the rules of management of actions, therefore suggesting proper guidelines during decision and response. The approach can take advantage of two inputs, as indicated in this chart. On one side, the simulation of egress is performed on specific finite cases with a view on the entire domain of the public space considered. This step is performed offline in the sense that simulations are run in a planning step that comes before an event occurrence. On the other side, information gathered from the simulation of scenarios can take advantage of smart city infrastructures. In fact, sensors and actuators can make available virtual real-time and online data that allow for the matching with a pre-simulated scenario and the related features, operating guidelines and actions taken. The risk assessment step follows these procedures and makes it possible to indicate how a risk index spreads along the open public space. Without going into much detail, 
The model for risk analysis is based on the so-called radial basis function. They are determined by based functions that embed the distance from the sensor and weights that are assigned according to anomalies detected by sensors with respect to the base case simulated. In this way, we can map in space and time a risk index after a triggering event has set in motion the crowd. Let's see this approach through a case study. We consider the public open space here represented, and we need as an input the geometry of the space. Normally, in this case study, six aggressor routes are available as indicated and numbered. According to the event, different number and classes of people can be featured, and as said, this parameter has a role in the overall aggress efficiency. In addition, a set of rules during planned or unplanned events can be expected depending on the specific context and decisions imposed by authorities. On this basis, we created a set of aggressive scenarios under different constraints. We discuss here only two of these scenarios of which the risk index is assessed. However, related concepts have a larger degree of flexibility in simulating different events. You can see here a first simulated best scenario is involving 1,000 people. The features of the people are allocated according to statistical distribution, but the, there is a large opportunity to set a range of parameters related to age, velocity, and behavioral properties of each person. In this scenario, all aggressive routes are available for evacuation. Let's see how the crowd behaves after a triggering event. As you can notice, a significant number of people prefer the aggressive routes number six. These aggressive routes, along with the aggressive routes number five, experience a phase of overcrowding during evacuation that, in the base case scenarios, lasts for about 40 seconds. On the contrary, aggressive routes number as one, two, and three are underused with respect to their capacity. It is clear how people in crowds tend to aggregate to familiar cues despite a discouraging waiting time for egress. These logics can be approached in this strategy. A different egress can be induced, for example, by using actuators or proper management strategies. These scenarios show how the crowd would behave when three out of six egress routes are made unavailable. We should consider that once properly planned and managed, such a context may leave space to a corridor to emergency operators coming to this area. In the present case, the corridor group's entrances are previously identified as one, five, and C. Let's watch at the simulation. We can observe that despite a longer total time for egress, a similar context results in a limited overcrowding on egress route number two, that according to people density maps never exceeds a critical threshold. Egress route number three is still underused, but the egress capacity of all the egress routes is better balanced and optimized. For example, in the smart city concept, the selection of the egress route can be induced by smart lighting as a threat is detected. In this approach and context, the simulation give valuable information on what is happening across the aggress routes. These figures show a comparison between the flow rate of people that goes through an aggress gate in time coordinate according to the two simulated scenarios. The maximum flow rate of people crossing a gate can be estimated along with how this information varies in time, especially in the very first moments after the triggering event. This allows also for setting a threshold value that alerts an ongoing anomalous scenario. During the egress, different trends can be detached and these simulated profiles can be compared with that retrieved, for example, by counter person sensors. Deviation with respect to a baseline can be used as an indicator or alert of an ongoing event that requires an immediate management. Starting from these discussed scenarios, a risk index is evaluated. The related magnitude and the variation in space and time can be interpreted as a driver for tracking how a context behaves before, during, and after a triggering event. For example, we associate the risk index map to the first scenario with all aggressor routes available before a perturbation occurs. The location of aggressor routes are indicated 
in which a base case value is expected. If we focus to a later time frame, for example, after 12 seconds, the risk index distributed according to this map with perturbations tracked at the egress gates. The risk index clearly grows with alterations in the egress dynamics. The same accent happens with the second scenario. Although a different risk index trend can be observed. In this case, after 12 seconds, the highest risk index is observed in the right corner corresponding to the specific aggressor route to number four in our simulations. This approach allows also detecting anomalies. For example, given the first base case scenario, free from anomalous people flows, that is scenario A in our work, a sensor located in the location indicated on the right can detect an anomaly based on people flow criteria after 12 seconds, a triggering point as of course. Some consideration and comments can be formulated. As said, some scenarios of crowd movement can be intrinsically at high risk, requiring proper planning and a response. A risk increase can be, let's say, ascribed to the total number of people present within a certain area that a triggering event induces ingress. Also, the availability and the vulnerability of egress routes may impact their overall performance. It is clear that the nature of the triggering event induces a crowd response. Some triggering events, including explosions or fires, can lead to an availability of planned egress routes and therefore to more severe outcomes. We have shown that the crowd management is a valuable strategy to mitigate such scenarios, which can be simulated in advance. This can be accomplished by properly planning, let's say, and driving an aggressor through a set of aggressive gates to relieve overcrowding. At the same time, uh, such a driving approach can help decision makers to allocate emergency corridors in order to optimize resources based on a risk-based decision approach. In this strategy, simulations can help assess the risk index that can be associated to time for alerting about the critical situations that emerge in terms of, in terms of uh, an anomaly people flow. Three short values can be simulated and identified according to criteria that the law enforcement bodies want to achieve, also in light of the vulnerability of a specific context considered. I want to conclude my presentation with some insights on egress from public cases. Evidently, some misconceptions about panicky crowds exist. Despite being characterized by different parameters, a crowd behaves according to some rules that can be approached from a scientific perspective. In this light, crowd science and simulation, as those illustrating in this work, can support law enforcement in planning and managing criticalities related to planned but also unplanned events. Once a risk-based approach is adopted, reference scenarios can be used to alert about threshold values that help in uh, uh, correctly adopting a resilient response to a triggering event. In addition, a structured approach to aggress scenarios can help assessing the performance of the public space in light of selected threats and operational solutions. But it must be said that one of the most important challenges is coupling such simulations to real-time data from sensors that can be used to give an indication of the related risk. This indicator can be strategically linked to a set of operational guidelines that enhance the management of actions and resources for responding to such events. I stop here my presentation and I thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Paolo. Does anyone have questions for Paolo? Uh, Martina, please. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, also we have seen uh, in this uh, conference a lot of different tools that uh, with different uh, maturity level and, uh, diff and they deal also with different uh, end users. In the, your last slide, you were showing uh, the possibility of using uh, also this tool for uh, different uh, events, uh, uh, for different phases uh, of the events, like uh, 
uh, for being ready and then uh, during after uh, the events for learning. So I, I would like to, if you can provide uh, uh, some additional information on how the, the tool has been used uh, in this uh, project and uh, also what are the main challenges for this tool in this kind of uh, projects. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, this, uh, this approach can be used in different, uh, in different situations. Uh, within uh, the 2020 project Impetus, uh, we have uh, taken, let's say, the occasion to validate uh, some of our, uh, of our approaches to, to such a situation in the pilots uh, planned in uh, Oslo and uh, Padova. Uh, during which we have also, uh, as a consortium, simulated uh, different initiating events, uh, a gunshot, uh, a struggle, or, or we can embed different initiating events uh, because of a sort of flexibility in this approach to manage, let's say, in a general perspective, a triggering event. Uh, a triggering event may be represented not only by a person that is doing something, but also by a natural event like an earthquake or something that is severe in such a way to put people in a situation to go away from a specific uh, place. But also in the case of explosions or fires or toxic attacks, uh, these uh, are also uh, very uh, important and very interesting um, initiating events that can be embedded in uh, such an approach. I hope to have uh, answers to your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And then just another quick, uh, that is more a curiosity than a, a, yeah. a question. Uh, I. I assumed that uh, the, the square and the image that you shown was uh, Piazza di Signori, right? Yeah, it was Piazza di Signori. <laughs> this is what yeah. we learned during <laughs> impetus, but probably for ethics issues, you didn't mention the name. So now we yeah. know <laughs> where we did the, the test. I was uh, wondering, uh, because uh, I imagine that for this kind of models, uh, the, uh, most of the time and effort is spending uh, in a modeling uh, uh, the uh, yeah the different uh, places. So um, yeah, how much approximately it would require to model uh, with uh, this kind of details, uh, uh, a square, uh, and also the the squares that you model for the two for the yeah for the two acceptance pilot. Yeah, uh, uh, as you have said, uh, just said, it is a matter of time in uh, performing, in the planning and performing the numerical simulations. It uh, lasts about uh, um, some days to proper uh, set the simulation that then should be uh, validated with some parameters that, for, for example, need a, a sort of correction. Uh, a running simulation is very short. Uh, it requires a very, very short time period, L let's say a, a, some minutes, but changing the simulations, if we, it depends on the degree on the, of detail that we want, it uh, uh, requires uh, even hours. Uh, so this is my, my answer yeah, to, to your question. Yeah. Thank, thanks, thank thanks a lot. Thank you, Paolo. I have one question. You mentioned briefly at one point that where this could lead to was using smart lighting to perhaps, if I understood right, to indicate to people what might be the advised egress route. Do you know of any research that tells the extent to which people would actually follow the advice? So if there's a green light saying you should be going this way, but the people think, I think that way looks better, you know, it looks more open or whatever. Is there any research about that? How obedient are people in following advice? Yeah. We... I know that the people in this project aren't very obedient, so I, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just wonder <laughs> if there's research. Uh, yeah, there, there, there are some research work oriented at analyzing 
how people react to a smart lighting, to a light, uh, to colors, and, and so on. And what uh, it emerges is that uh, um, sometimes the smart lighting, it is not enough to drive uh, people out of a public space. Usually uh, a strategy that is more effective is uh, saying something, saying something loudly uh, with uh, an indication from the city infrastructure that is saying, okay, people, please take that way that is a, a green light. So uh, this is what is emerging from the research. Yeah. Okay, so, so, thank you very much. Uh, just when you connect with that, I remember reading some research about fire alarms for children yeah. and adults, they, 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 they evacuate if they hear a bleeping noise. Children evacuate if they hear a voice of an adult saying, there's a fire, you should leave. Yeah. They, they're more yeah. receptive to that. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've got to the end of the day. And so thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you. And indeed, thank you to all of the presenters today who, who've all given very interesting presentations in, 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 in a lot of detail on many interesting topics. I, I would like to open now for anyone who has any final questions or indeed observations that they might want to make in conclusion about where did we get today? Does anyone have anything they would like to say? Either the people who can speak or the people who can write in chat, anything you want to end with. Okay, then I can say what I would think, for me at least, were the conclusions from today, and people can challenge or agree or disagree with me. Um, the day started with a discussion about is impetus challenging or not? Mathieu told us that he thought it was challenging when he started to write it, and even more challenging when the project started to run. And when I sit here today and listen to all the presentations and all the details and all the complexities of the various parts, I'm starting to think it's even more complicated than it was this morning when I joined the meeting. There's really a lot going on here. I learned that the word resilience is something that we haven't talked about on a day-to-day -day basis very much in the project. But from the, some of the context that I got today, I understand more that actually fundamentally at the core of what we're doing is an attempt to improve resilience. And I hadn't been very conscious of that before. I think that our idea of the three pillars, which is something we've built a lot of the project structure on of technology, ethics and process is indeed a sound and well-founded way to go. I think that's been confirmed in, in various ways by what was presented today. And I think that it's also clear from what we've heard today that all of the theories, all of the technology, all of the ideas wouldn't get very far if it weren't for the validation that we're doing in these two cities. And my final conclusion for the day is that I'm a lucky guy to have such a good team working on such an exciting project. And I think I'll make that be my last word for today. I don't know, Harald, if you're still here, if you want to say goodbye or anything. Yes, I will. Uh, yep. Thank you, Joe, for the excellent sharing. And everybody kept time and they showed up. And uh, this was uh, quite a lot of information all speakers, thank to them, thank to the visitors. And I think what we have here uh, recorded, that will also be used in the publication material we are providing for impetus. So thank you, Joe and the team and all your listeners. The only thing I can say, you're welcome back tomorrow, 10 o'clock to the last day of the uh, conference. So thank you all and have a nice evening. And same to you, Harold, and thank you once again on our behalf for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Goodbye.